Hello, my name is Shahryar Shahryari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on introductory combinatorics based on my book, An Invitation to Combinatorics. But the subject of this lecture is Ferrer's diagrams for integer partitions. If n and k are non-negative integers, a partition of n with k parts is a sequence of positive integers such that they add up to n and they are in weakly decreasing order. The first one is the biggest one, then the next one, and so on, and they add up to n. So these integers, lambda 1 through lambda k, are called the parts of that partition. And if you have a partition, then we use this notation well, with a vertical line and a line in the middle of it. We read this as lambda is a partition of n. And what that means is that lambda is a sequence of k positive integers that add up to n, and they're written in this weakly decreasing order, non-increasing order. Sometimes we augment lambda with zeros. In some arguments, you might need to do that, but that won't change the partition. If n is greater than zero, then the notation p n of sub k is the number of partitions of n with k parts, and p of n is going to be the total number of partitions of n. Now for zero, we also say that p of zero sub zero is one, but p of zero sub k is zero if k is greater than zero. And as a result, p of zero itself is going to be one. Ferris diagrams are a way of visualizing these partitions, and it's helpful when you make arguments. In fact, sometimes you can use Ferris diagrams to come up with results that you might not have guessed before, and we'll see an example of that. If n is a positive integer and lambda is a partition of n, the way we're going to depict that is you're going to place lambda 1 dots, that's the first part, in a row, and then below those and left aligned, we're going to put lambda 2 dots, and below those and left aligned again, we're going to put lambda 3 dots, and we're going to continue. How many dots are we going to have all together? We're going to have n dots all together, and they're organized according to lambda 1, lambda 2, true lambda k. So they're organized in k rows, and they show us what this partition is. This is called the Ferris diagram of lambda, named after the mathematician Norman Ferris, who first used these to prove a theorem that we will see later in this talk. In the previous video, I showed you recurrence relations for p of n sub k, and I can show you those using Ferrer diagrams as well. If n is greater or equal to k and both are positive integers, the number of partitions of n into k parts is the same as the number of partitions of n minus 1 into k minus 1 parts, plus the number of partitions of n minus k into k parts. Now, why is that? If you look at a partition of n with k parts, it might be that the last part, the smallest part, is size 1. You look at that one, and if you get rid of it, what happens is you get a partition of n minus 1 into k minus 1 parts because you've just got rid of one of those rows. Now you have fewer rows. And vice versa, if you have a partition of n minus 1 into k minus 1 parts and add a one dot at the bottom, then you get a partition of n into k parts. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence because these two maps are inverses of each other. They're both one-to-one -one and onto, but between partitions of n into k parts that have a one at the end and all partitions of n minus 1 into k minus 1 parts. So that's where this comes from. But there are other partitions of n into k parts. There are ones where the last part is not 1. In that case, what you do is you don't just take 1 off, because if you 1 off, then you still have a partition of n minus 1 into k parts. But what you do this time is that you take 1 from each row off. And if you do that, then you will get a partition of what? You took k, because there was k parts, you took k dots away, and so you have a partition of n minus k, because all parts their sizes were greater than 1, you still have a partition into k parts, and so you have a partition of n minus k into k parts. Vice versa, if you have a partition of n minus k into k parts, if you just add one dot to every row, you get a partition of n, but again in k parts. And as a result, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between partitions of n into k parts, where the last part is greater than 1, and all partitions of n minus k into k parts. And that's why when we add these, we get the partitions of n into k, because partitions of n into k either have a 1 at the end or they don't. If they have a 1 at the end, then the number of them is the same as p of n minus 1 sub k minus 1. If they have a bigger than 1 at the bottom, then the number of those is p of n minus k sub k. We have another way of coming up with a recurrence relation, and that's the following. If you have a partition of n into k non-empty parts, that means there's some dot in every row. What if we just take all those dots out, one from each row? If we do that, then we get a partition of n minus k things, but this time some of the parts might be empty. Like in the example that I have here in the diagram, one of the parts is going to be empty, but there might be more than one that's empty. It's going to be partitions of n minus k into k or fewer parts. The number of partitions of n into k parts is the same as partitioning n minus k into k parts, because maybe you will use that last row, or n minus k into k minus 1 parts, 
or n minus k all the way till one part or zero part. So this is our second recurrence relation. This recurrence relation allows us to come up with small values. For example, that nine is that seven plus that two, according to one of our recurrence relations, or it's the sum of everything in that row, two plus three plus three plus one plus zero, everything starting from zero all the way till two gives us nine. I wanna now show you how thinking about these Farad diagrams helps us in coming up with results about partitions. So let's say lambda is a partition of n and it has a Farad diagram f. Now, if you transpose f, that means that you take the first column and make it a row. If you take the second column and make that a row and so forth, that also is a Farad diagram. The only thing that could go wrong is if that after you do that, some row will have more dots than the one before, but that will not happen because the second column is never gonna have more rows than the first column because we have wrote everything left aligned. So if you see something in column I, in column I minus one and so on, they're all gonna be dots as well. So the tr transpose of a Ferris diagram is also a Ferris diagram and the partition of N whose Ferris diagram is that transpose is called the conjugate of lambda and denoted by lambda prime. For example, four to one partitions seven. And if you transpose that, what happens? The first column is three, that becomes the first row here. The second column is two, that becomes the second row. And then you have one and one. So you get three, two, one, one. And that's a different partition of seven. And these two partitions on the face of them don't seem to have anything in common because one is into three parts, one is into four parts, but they are friends because they're just conjugates of each other. Let's look at an example. If n is six in case three from our table, the number of partitions of six into three parts is three. These are two, 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 three, two, one, and four, one, one. Now let's find their conjugates. If you transpose those, you get three, 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 two, one, and three, one, one, one. So if you take all the partitions of six into three parts and transpose all of them, find their conjugates, then th the number of parts is not three anymore. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four, but because the three we started with all had three parts, all of these will have their largest part be three. Their, their number of parts is not three anymore, but the largest part, the one on top is three. And if you take a partition of six where the largest part is three and transpose it, you will get a partition of six into three parts. And so that's actually a theorem. It's what Ferris proved that when he came up with these diagrams. So if n and k are positive integers and n is greater or equal to k, the number of partitions of n into k parts, p of n sub k, is the same as the number of partitions of n into any number of parts whose largest part is exactly k. And what's the proof of that? I'm just going to repeat myself. Just conjugate the Ferris diagrams. If you conjugate all the Ferris diagrams of partitions of n into k parts, you will get partitions of n into different number of parts, but whose largest part is exactly k. And conjugation is its own inverse, which means that this function has an inverse, which means that it's one to one and onto. And so it's a bijection. Because it's a bijection, the number of partitions of n into k parts is the same as the number of partitions of n into any number of parts whose largest part is exactly k. I want to do one more thing with Ferris diagrams. n is a positive integer and lambda is a partition of n. Lambda prime is the conjugate of lambda. Now, what if lambda and lambda prime are the same? So you take the Ferris diagram and transpose it and you get the same thing. In that case, we say that lambda is self-conjugate. And for example, if you look at self-conjugate part partitions of 13, these are the ones you get. These are the ones that if you take the rows and make them into columns or take columns and make them into rows, it's back where you started. So what can we say about them, about these self-conjugate partitions of 13? So here they are again, the self-conjugate partitions of 13. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at that first one and I'm going to say, I've got this long series of dots going up and then going across. I'm going to straighten it out and make it into just one row. If I do that, I will get 13 things. I will get the partition into one part. Remember that row is just one part. Partition into 13. That's what I get. What I'm going to do for the second one, I'm going to first look at the dots on top and the first column. And so I'm going to take that and straighten it out. If I do that, I will have how many things? I have four things here and four things here and then the one in the corner. Nine things. Now I put nine dots here. It's always going to be odd because the number of things in the row and the column are the same, but they share one thing. Without that thing they share, they have the same things. So twice that plus one. So it's going to be an odd number. So that's nine. Then I'm going to take the next layer, the next upside down L-shaped thing. So these red dot dots here, and I'm going to straighten that. 
And again, I will get an odd number again for the same reasoning and I'm smaller than the previous one. So I will get three things and then I have that last one lot and I put that. So I will get this other partition, part 931, again, a partition of 13. But this time, these are all going to be odd numbers. And because I'm going layer in every time, I'm going to get distinct to odd numbers. I will do the same thing with that. I'll take that top layer and the left hand side layer, strengthen that out into in, into one row. Then I will go in and do the next layer. And finally, the last one, as a result, I will get this 751 and vice versa. You can reverse this process. If you have an odd number of dots in a row, you can take that middle one. If there's odd, there's going to be something in the middle. For example, if there's 15 things, you will have seven and seven, that's 14. And you've got one in the middle. Take that one in the middle and bend the other guys and make yourself a row and a column. As long as all of the rows are odd numbers and distinct, you can keep bending them and putting them as layers and then get a self conjugate partition of your number. And so what we have proved is that if you have n positive integer, the number of self conjugate partitions of n is the same as the number of partitions of n into distinct odd parts. Distinct means that no two parts are the same. Odd means that each of them have odd number of elements. We could write this down more formally. That's what I've done in my book, but the picture is really worth a thousand words. The picture is the thing that shows you the bijection, the one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you want to work with partitions, you can use the recurrence relations, you can use Ferris diagram, but most powerfully you can use generating functions. And we'll get to those when we get to the generating function videos. This is the end of this lecture. Like my video and subscribe to my channel if you want to be subjected to more math videos in your feed and keep hydrated at all times.